Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of a podcast that talks exclusively about the sport of triathlon. It's called Talking Triathlon. Uh, it used to be MX Endurance. Uh, we'd link bring that in. My name is Tim Ford, and I'm joined this week by none other than the sexiest voice in triathlon himself, James Belgimbo. How are you going, mate? Yeah, I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. I'm stranded in a hotel room in Birmingham at the moment, so I'm I'm sans laptop. I'm recording on my phone using my headphone mic, so you know there might be a slight audio quality difference this week. But other than that, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Good, mate. Good. Again, it's uh, I think when you've got the sexiest voice in triathlon, you could record through a tin can and piece of string, it would still sound good, mate. So our listeners are still probably getting their weekly fix, and they are going to get a bigger weekly fix of James Bell this week because you are doing an interview. Uh, in a couple of hours, actually, with Martin Van Reel that I am not going to be part of because I'm going to be having a little schnooze. Uh, it's the middle of the night for me. So that's going to be this week's episode. So it's a, it's a big James episode this week, uh, which I know that people are excited yeah, I've about. Yeah, um, I've got a breakfast date with Martin Van Reel tomorrow morning. Did you just call him Martin Van Reel? <laughs> I did. I did, but I just rolled on through it, hoping you wouldn't notice. But I yeah, just the, love uh... you've got this. Like... <laughs> you and names. I, I want to I create like a... An encyclopedia of James's alternative names for people. Like we've got, we've got Leon. One, Leo, of, those, Leo one of those posters with the little jerseys. So just put the names underneath. Yeah, Leo Shepherdess, Phil Mignon, <laughs> Leon Chevalier, <laughs> Martin Martin Ranville, Martin Ranville, <laughs> Martin Ranville. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we're going to be having coffee tomorrow morning and uh, eight o'clock UK time, nine o'clock Central European time. We're going to get together, record an interview for the meat of this podcast. So uh, looking, really looking forward to have a chat with that man because he's such a nice bloke and he's always good fun to have on the pod. So it's going to be interesting. It's one I'm genuinely upset not to be part of because, again, huge, huge Martin Ranville fan. And hey, I did that for you. And uh, also, I, I think <clears throat> I think he is... I'm going to make an extremely early call here. I think he is going to be one of the ab- favorites, if not the winner of 70.3 worlds this year. I think he is. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have a feeling on that too. I, I would, I think that calls a little early, but I back you in that, in the, in the, um, the feeling behind it. Um, I mean, he's obviously had a bit of injury, isn't he? You mm-hmm. know, we've seen him out of racing for a while. It is a real shame when he's not involved in racing because he leaves, he lives quite a void behind him. Because he's such an exciting, interesting athlete and character that uh, that the sport is a worse place when he's not in it. Mm, definitely, definitely. But look, I'll let you talk to him a little bit later. Uh, guys, if you enjoy the podcast, want to support the podcast, head to patreon.com forward slash talking triathlon. We get a bonus monthly episode, uh, WhatsApp group, Facebook group, all that good stuff helps us keep the lights on. People say that often on podcasts. Uh, I caught up with Sam Renouf for a coffee this week, the CEO for the PTO. Sat down with Sam yesterday for a, for a chat. He was in Sydney town. And, the big uh, dog. The big dog himself. Actually, I I think I definitely want to organize it. I want to have a chat with him probably in the coming weeks. I think I'll reach out to him. But not specifically. I just want to have a chat with him around the state of the sport, I think, because we, we definitely discussed it yesterday. And I found his insights so fascinating. And he's just, again, a legend of a man. But I guess the reason I wanted to talk about it, and I don't want to necessarily talk about the specifics, but I, I told you about it is I walked away from it feeling really optimistic about the sport, which is something that I've probably been struggling with a bit lately. I've, I've been going up and down a little bit about optimism, pessimism. Some people fucking think we're the most pessimistic people on the planet based on comments. They do. People, p- people think, seem to get the impression that we are very negative about triathlon, which I don't. I don't think that's fair. I don't think we are. I think we're just two people who really love the sport and want to see the very, very best for it and uh, and therefore hold it to quite a high standard. <laughs> or oh, there was the episode we did where we were super positive, but like, God, you're so positive about it. Like, why are you so, you, you, you think, it's like, oh, okay, all right, Goldilocks, no worries. But that, that, that's fine. But no, I just, I, I really walked away feeling very, very optimistic, uh, which is what you, you know, what you want, which is, which is great. But uh, now that was a, it was a good little catch up, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's I'm I'm very excited to see uh, where we're going with the next. So few... have you got have you got any juicy stuff you can share with us? Mm, absolutely not. No, absolutely it was, it, it, not. No, it was it was just it was just like we just talked about all sorts of stuff, really. Um, I think the one of the things I did enjoy was he was talking about how they brought their strategy out for the T100 series, like you know December 2022 or wherever it was. Yeah, probably December 2022. And he was saying, because I know that Sam, I know Sam's listening now. Um, 
when we recorded probably this time last year or around this time where we were talking about like our ideal situation for what a, a series and he was like like f1 team you know narrative season long like oh and he's just like have they seen the document like have they seen the document we prepared <laughs> because everything we named was included in their document so i was like that's what i said i said you know this series is exactly what um i've always wanted to see and that's why i'm so excited about it so i have yeah. seen all the documents they don't call me the document controller for nothing mate and nothing goes past so you. so what uh what insight can you give us what was his take on how miami went i mean as we've said right i think they're not trying to pretend like you know i think they they certainly are aware of the flaws with it and see the room for improvement uh which we've said along right like we know that they know and that seems to sort of be like they know they know that it wasn't up to where they wanted it to be uh but yeah it's like look out for miami not miami uh singapore i think from what I've heard, Singapore yeah. is going to be a good one. I think it's going to be the one, isn't it? I've got a feeling that it's almost going to be the the kind of unofficial launch, if you know what I mean. I think Miami was was like the prologue, let's yeah. say. Yeah. You know, whereas Singapore is going to be the one where I feel like they are going to have more control over everything involved in that race. And I think it's going to be a better spectacle, a better broadcast. And, um, and hopefully, due to the nature of the course better and more interesting racing to to follow as a viewer i said this last week and i i still think if you had to if if you had to like wish list of what you want to see in a race course singapore literally has everything like you could the maybe the exception is a rough swim maybe you want to see you know some some chop or something but like literally in the center of singapore like not not out in the boons like in singapore you you, you swim in at Marina Bay Sands. Like, I, if people haven't been to Singapore, I cannot emphasize how well located like, this race is in Singapore. It's hilly. It's got some really pinchy climbs. It's got some long grinding climbs. It's technical. It's got some real chicanes and stuff. It's hot. It is everything you'd want in a like. We always criticize yeah, World yeah. Triathlon about oh, and, and, and in the swim when the camera pans up to the Marina Marina Bay Hotel. You know, you're going to see the icons of that city in the background as the race is playing out you know you're not going to be i don't know iron man las vegas and it's fucking 40 miles away do you know what i mean it, it's it's going to be right slap bang in the middle of of the characteristics and um and details that make that city stand out yeah i, I i've said it before and i'll say i remember last year because i did the age group race and swimming and i'm like breathing <clears> looking up and there's marina bay sands and i'm just like what is that? how is how is this possible like how is it, how is this real? And even forget like Singapore is my favorite city on the planet to run in. Like I have this loop I do in Singapore. Every single time I go to Singapore, I do this run loop. It is, it is my, my single favorite run loop that exists. And the fact that half of, or a quarter of that run loop was the run course for the race. I was just like, how, how good is this? Like you, this is fantastic. Yeah. 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 So um, talking about seeing things that you don't think are real, you know, the one place I've been where I just, my brain couldn't compute what I was seeing. I know where it, it is. looked almost, you know where it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the, in Utah, Snow St. Canyon. George, Snow, Snow Canyon. Yeah, it mate. was like, it was like my brain was seeing it and thinking it was CGI. It was insane. Well, Snow Canyon as well. It also just comes out of nowhere. Right. Like I remember when we drove mm. out there, cause I think the first day I rode out there, I rode the day before I wrote, but then we drove out there together. And yeah, you just like it's like houses, 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 houses stop desert. <laughs> and you go in the next yeah. minute, you're just like, where the fuck did this come from? It's it's unbelievable. And then it gets better, doesn't it? You're on the road and you think, well, this is fucking amazing. And then you walk 20 minutes and it just becomes oh yeah. Almost impossible to perceive how amazing that place is. Utah is the best place I've visited in America, actually. Like I, mm. I had I had a very good time in St. George. The people were so friendly. A beautiful, beautiful place, and the coffee was good. That was the main thing for me. We found that that vegan cafe that had the best coffee. That was that uh, was good coffee. Was it good was coffee, good coffee. It? Yeah. Um. Look, we just before we drop in the Martin Van Real thing, uh, because I don't want to take you up too much of your time today while you're in your your, your stunning hotel room, YouTube.com, if you want to check it out. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the World Cup event that happened in Hong Kong over the weekend because I, I've watched it. Uh, and I don't necessarily want to talk about the race itself, although the racing was excellent. We're seeing, you know, it's really good to see, uh, you know, I think we've had a bunch of athletes race, Cassandra Begrand, Georgia Taylor-Brown, Vincent Louis, um, Ken Janina, like lots of people racing around or not just in uh, Hong Kong. But, mate, this Hong Kong race, I, I, I talked about the Napier World Cup event that we saw Hayden Wilde do a few weeks ago, how well broadcast it was. 
this this Hong Kong World Cup was similarly broadcasted exceptionally well. And not just that, what a venue for a race. I'm actually disappointed it was just a World Cup event because I thought, fuck, this is a good spot. Like this would be a fantastic location for any sort of event, like a, a T100, a, a WTCS race. But Mate, I don't know. I, I hope to believe that somebody at World Triathlon has been like, yeah, we need to do something about this because our broadcast has been a bit shit. So um, do you think this is the start of them upping them game, they're upping their game across the board? Or do you think that we're just seeing uh, a few good races and then we'll see that standard maintain throughout the season? My brain says that it's probably just going to go back to what it was. My heart is going, no, no, they've listened, they've learned, and they've improved. Uh, what made know. it What made it better? Fixed cameras. So there's lots of fixed cameras. There was like drone, I assume drone shots. There was less of the shaky on the back of a motorbike cam. It very much seemed to be cameras on the course just filming. So there was a, there was a range. You could really identify, like, like I keep talking about, with a looped course, there was enough landmarks and stuff. So you, at all times, you knew where the athletes were. And without even needing to see the splits, you could tell visually the gaps because you knew the landmarks on the course. Okay. They're at this point. Okay. They've gone under the bridge. Okay. So you could very easily follow the race from that point of view. And I like the graphics were relatively good. The commentary was pretty good. There was a few, like you could tell they didn't have a lot to talk about. So there was sort of dead air a few times, but like, it was just, it was, it reminded me a lot of, and maybe it's just the, like a major Asian city thing, but like the, 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 the sort of feel you get from that Tokyo Olympic course, but with people, okay. like not heaps of, but it wasn't packed. Like I'm not talking about, you know, this huge crowd, but it was just a very <laughs> well laid out. I mean, it's still a pretty boring bike course, right? Like it's not, there's not big climbs or anything. There's a few little climbs, but yeah, I just, I just really was impressed by the the package. So I'm very critical of world triathlon a lot of the time, but I, again, I'm, I'm a big believer in giving credit where it's due. And for me, the two world cup events that I've watched so far this year, uh, excellent. I tried to watch that Portugal European uh, cup race and it was unwatchable. So <laughs> that one was terrible, yeah. but again, it's a European cup probably, you know, that's, that's, you know, another sort of couple of rungs down. So the fact that it was broadcast is okay, but, um, both world cup events I've watched this year have been uh, of a very, very good quality and uh, people who, uh, gave up, I'd say maybe it's time to go back and give it another shot because uh, the broadcast was surprisingly good. There you go. There you go. Well, that's what we want to hear, isn't it? You know, mm. and that's the kind of thing that we want to see continue and maintain. Mm. Now, um, last time we had Martin Van Reel on, it was it was the source of my favorite reel yeah. we put on Instagram, I think, wasn't it? Wasn't that him? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that one. <laughs> that was the first thing I put when we started the Talking Triathlon channel. That was the first reel I reposted because I was like, I, I, I love that moment so much. He's, he's, he's the best. He's the honestly, like I've said this, he's my favorite triathlete. Like genuinely, not 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 ironically anything. I just he's he's wonderful. He everything about he's funny. He's he ah, and I just really think he T one hundred series. All those athletes currently do the T one hundred series should be very thankful that he's not racing the full thing because I reckon he's going to rip the legs off everybody, off everybody. Uh, if if he did the full thing, I think Martin Van Rue would win this by a country mile. I I really. To me, he's kind of like the chosen one of middle distance. Come at me. Don't at me, actually. I don't give a shit. But yeah, no. Um, no, he's a good bloke. Should we go and find out how good a bloke he is? We shall. We'll drop that in and we'll be back afterwards. And so, yeah, as we just said, I'm lucky enough to be joined this morning by Martin Van Reel. He is a two-time Olympian, four-time 70.3 winner, and is currently aiming for the uh, Olympic Games in Paris. How are you, Martin? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, early morning here, so I, I will maybe need some time to warm up a little bit. But uh, no, I'm I'm feeling good. Uh, it's been a weird season up until now, and it's gonna be a yeah, weird yeah. season, I think. You know but, why uh, you need time to warm up, don't you? Because as you say, it's an early morning. It's because you've skipped your run session you were gonna do before we had a chat, and you stayed in bed. So um, that's why you need time to warm up. Come on, don't don't tell the listeners that. Eh? <laughs> They're all gonna think that I have uh, I have zero discipline. <laughs> uh, sometimes staying in bed is uh, is the good option i think this morning it was <laughs> I'll yeah do it yeah so how's life how's things treating you at the moment um yeah pretty good i mean i'm feeling really good like physically um i've had a really good winter of training so i think that i'm back at the level like my highest level i've been which i think 
has been the summer of uh, 2021 um, mm -hmm. when I came fourth at the Olympics and second in uh, second behind world triathlon championships leader Christian Blumefeld. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like um, I think I'm really close to that level, but then the cancellation of um, Abu Dhabi actually threw like yeah a lot of of uh, things at me that now yeah my qualification got a little bit more difficult um, and I had to reschedule a lot of the year which is pretty frustrating to be honest yeah um, yeah especially knowing that I'm good but yeah I haven't shown other people that I'm good so uh, that's the difficult part of it so yeah so when are you looking to get that final decision made when's that gonna happen um, so yeah, the decision is just going to be, uh, um, like the, the federation can basically just choose who they want to pick mm -hmm. and, uh, Yella is already qualified because, uh, we had criteria, but I didn't make them because, um, my two last years have been pretty terrible with my ankle injury and yeah. we had to do two top eights at world triathlon series, um, which, yeah, normally for a healthy me, that wouldn't be very hard, but I came actually even still ninth twice, but um, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't make the top eight. Um, so now the federation can basically just choose who they <clears> want <throat> to take for the other spot. So Yella is qualified in the men. Um, and I have to say the third guy right now is a big step under both me and yellow like he's uh 99th on the world triathlon ranking but he's a good runner so like it's not impossible that he does like maybe around the 10th place on the world series um all of a sudden so yeah then now i was planning to only do cagliari but if i would have a flat or whatever the federation told me yeah you you have to prove yourself uh this year um now, so done, now it would have been really been helpful for that yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, if, if I have Abu Dhabi, I could put that to bed and, like, have a good result there and just focus on uh, on Cagliari. But, yeah, now I'm going to have to do Yokohama as well, um, which I obviously like racing, but I think <clears throat> it's not ideal uh, towards Olympics because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do uh, Yokohama, Cagliari, and then I'm going to throw in a T100 two weeks after as well so uh, love yeah, to hear uh, it mate <laughs> love to hear it i mean because uh, things were <laughs> things were tracking really nicely for you weren't they with your sixth place in in rio fourth place in tokyo you know you you were you've proven yourself at the middle distance as well because i think if you're if you're training well and you're racing well at the at the olympic distance that translates nicely to the 70.3 distance and you were you've got your four for four at the 70.3 with four races four wins but then you went and you've you've got yourself an ankle injury at Leeds. Mm -hmm. In was it 2022 or 2021 yeah. you did that? 2022. 22. Um, what was that? Because was it was it it wasn't as cut and dry as like a broken ankle or something like that, was it? It was it was a bit more interesting. No, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I basically just twisted my ankle um like Leeds that year. It was in the park and the finish was kind of weird. I was already complaining a little bit about it before because it was basically one kilometer at maybe five, six percent downhill um, <clears throat> leading into the finish line. And then, uh, yeah, like if you would let yourself fall, I, I could see it because I was running with a stride sensor and I was going like 31 or 32 k's an hour, I think, Oof. when I fell. Like I was, just, <laughs> I was just leaning in and... and so yeah, that's basically comparable with a with a running uh with a cycling crash, sorry. Um and in the blue carpet there was like a little hole under it. And actually Tommy Zafiris did tell me that the day before that there was like yeah, just a little hole, but because you came with so much speed, I just completely twisted my ankle there and oh, mate. rolled over. And actually my first reaction, uh, I think you can see it on the finish line photos, is that I really braced my shoulder like I felt like I broke my collarbone or my shoulder um and they had like a, um, a wheelchair ready at the finish line so rolled me off 
uh, did some tests and like I started feeling that that shoulder while well, it didn't seem too bad and then I got up out of the wheelchair and all of a sudden I felt that like I could barely support myself on my right ankle um so was it one of those it wasn't one of those moments where you went down and it was instant ankle pain your body basically give the human brain's an interesting thing isn't it it prioritizes pain so because you yeah. thought you'd done your shoulder that was where you or your focus was and it wasn't until you'd got that release from your shoulder and stood up that you realized you'd hurt your ankle yeah indeed indeed and and even then after that like um because two weeks after this i still did one of my ninth place results actually in uh, in montreal um with a pretty good race um and yeah like it took me a couple of days before i could run again but then i could run again so i i thought in the past i actually twisted my ankle a couple of times and usually i could run on it after a couple of days again and just resume training um but then yeah it, like I did that race still and it was always okay. So the pain was not very bad, like maybe a three, four out of 10. And the people around me were saying like, yeah, like it's probably normal. Like it's just like a tear in the ligaments. Um, it's, it's normal that it will hurt uh, for a bit. So I kept running on it, kept running on it, went on altitude camp. I was doing like 100K weeks, 100 kilometer run weeks. Um, and then all of a sudden one run in in Fontrameu I was um I just couldn't go anymore like towards the end uh, I I couldn't go anymore it was really sharp pain all of a sudden and I've had some fractures uh before and actually I immediately knew it I still didn't really say it but the next morning <laughs> I tried to make one running step and I just I couldn't like yeah. my body wouldn't let me make like one running step and yeah had to go for a scan and and obviously it turned out to be a lot worse than uh, some torn ligaments um, yeah yeah i may i've been there i broke my ankle in january 2021 22 yeah. january 2022 it's a long it's a long road it's a long road yeah, yeah. You, when you're trying to deal with that because it takes so much weight and like you say they're they're tricky things they they can make you think they're getting better you can go for a run and then and then suddenly it just gets worse again and trying to get those ligaments better. And Did you have a fracture? Was there a fracture in there? No. So there wasn't a full fracture. So there was a, a lot of edema and there was like a little line visible, like a little uh, fracture visible, um, but mostly just a lot of bone edema. But the problem um, with that is that if I would start running again or whatever, like always it would swell up again, which means that I would be soaking that bone again in, in liquid, uh, basically. Yeah. So if like I tried restarting after two months of, of having taken two months off and basically it just got bad again because yeah, like um, my ankle started swelling again, which meant that the bone was <clears throat> sitting in liquid again, which meant the bone started swelling again which meant the edema was back and that was uh yeah very tough process to get like away from that and basically it meant that I didn't only have to stop with running but I had to stop like one month with with anything like I didn't do one month of um swimming biking or running and that's when uh I really made like a considerable leap forward that my ankle was actually looking good again on the scans but unfortunately by that time because we didn't really know i wasted a lot of time already so that was already yeah. like four or five months into the injury um and in the end i didn't i didn't run for six or seven months which is like yeah a very God, very long period uh, yeah mate it is isn't it an injury sucks doesn't it because you start you start you're all committed and you're like right i'm gonna i'm gonna get through this thing i'm gonna get better and then the, the longer it goes on, the harder it is to maintain all the satellite things. You know, all the things that you're meant to do to keep yourself healthy around the training and the racing, which is the diet and the, and and looking after yourself. Did you struggle with any of that during that period when you were injured to like to keep focused on maintaining a healthy optimum diet for training? Or or did you sort of fall off the cliff a little bit and find yourself watching Netflix and binging on Cadbury's chocolate? <laughs> I think that 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 uh, process I've done it a lot in my in my previous injuries uh, where I would kind of just let me go and like 
eat really bad things. Um, and especially what I would always do is uh, close myself off of like even the people that are close around me, even the coach and everything, like I would just not communicate with them for like weeks on end. Um, and I would like also not take up contact with a physio or whatever. So like I would basically just shut myself off from the world. Um, and then I would usually like make the process even longer. But this time I actually try to do like everything following the book basically so try to do everything good stay motivated i kept training a lot on the swim and the bike which yeah then in the end maybe that wasn't that good but um uh, actually yeah, i i had a lot of support around me and i think that i learned yeah from my previous injuries to not do those things to not shut yeah. myself out um and to keep communicating and and i think that actually shortened the process still like maybe otherwise i would like yeah like potentially it was almost a career ending injury uh even like some of the doctors that i saw were yeah very <laughs> pessimistic i would say um so i think that by having learned from previous injuries and dealing with it a bit little bit better uh i yeah i did it better this time but it's still very difficult like for instance when when i took that full month off um any training like you kind of just feel like you're not doing anything but at that moment that was probably the most important thing to yeah and that's what you're doing is it you feel like you're not doing anything but your body is busy it's busy healing yeah, yeah. that problem that you've got yeah indeed indeed and and that takes a lot of effort like and not only physically i yeah, like still it was obviously mentally a very challenging period when you come off the highs that i i just came off like doing that dubai uh world record and then like the um the olympics uh a year before to not being able to to run for six months which running is is still my insecurity because it's still my my weak point to really take a medal uh, especially on short course um so yeah like that that was mentally obviously very very uh challenging still when did it start to get better when did you start to feel like you were coming because we missed you in the sport mate through for that period when you were gone but when did for you did you start to think right things are heading in the right direction i can start racing again now <clears throat> um actually that went like quite quickly uh so um the the month that i took off that was november 2022 i think and then i did like a really good scan uh, beginning of december and then actually even the doctor told me like yeah like if you want we can start running and and i actually told him like well like i rather wait a little bit longer like while well, talking with the physio and everyone i decided to which would normally never be me i would always be the one like i i can run again like I would go to yeah. three different doctors just for the one that would tell me to run again. But um, so I, I decided 1st of January 2023 was going to be my first day of running again um, and then started the build up. But obviously that goes very slow after a period of half a year of no running. It's not that you can immediately do 100 kilometer weeks again. Um, so I would say by April, I was running like a bit normal again not normal volume mm -hmm. but i was could start to introduce some intensity um and then actually i, I did uh, yokohama in middle of may and actually it was all like i think i finished 13th um but with like a 30 20 or something 10k of the bike which was actually yeah kind of surprising to myself um but then unfortunately in the year, I had still a little bit uh, bad luck again in the summer. Um, so I couldn't really get like a linear progression. Um, but in general, I felt like I was really uh, improving throughout the year from there. Um, so yeah, like I was very happy to come back with that 13. That was actually very unexpected. I thought that it would take a lot longer to be back at the near the pointy end of the uh, world series racing yeah and then you finished the year with a win at uh, 70.3 bahrain you know <clears throat> you seem to be the master of the middle distance do you is 
is it a case of enjoying that distance more than anything else or is it just that your skill set really transfers across to that i think it's a combination um yeah like <laughs> i really really enjoy this distance and just long distance in general i think the reason uh and the influence why i came in the sport when i was a young kid i was not really dreaming of the going to the olympics like my inspiration was uh, Mark Hermans in Belgium, who was a long distance athlete and he took me in his team. He believed in me. So for me, like the, the highest was always Kona. Like I always wanted to go to Kona and like, like be an Ironman world champion. Um, and sometimes I think that also with the skill set I have, I'm more of like a long distance athlete that ended up in short distance racing than the other way around um so yeah i think um my skill set definitely also plays better in long distance because um i got a lot of really good results in short course like that sixth place like that fourth place but um often i come like a little bit short when it really comes down to the run and that's like a very small thing um, but margins I mean, are small aren't they but they yeah, make a difference like, yeah yeah maybe i am well maybe i, I hope this summer i am an, an alexi or a hayden wild but uh they are really 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 gifted runners and well i'm a better swimmer than them and like maybe hayden is also a really strong cyclist but i'm probably also one of the strongest maybe bikers maybe in... maybe he's a strong cyclist <laughs> no he's a very strong cyclist but um <laughs> Like, I'm also really strong in cycling. So I think that often being good in the three disciplines, yeah, it, it doesn't really translate into winning a lot of races in short course because you just basically have to be the, the strongest runner uh, because you're yeah. almost never going to come off the bike alone, which in long distance, that's a different thing. And I think that I can be uh, one of the guys who, yeah, even the strongest of the strongest Uber bikers, I think they will have difficulty uh, dropping me on the bike. And if I'm there on the run, like, I mean, I'm still one of the best runners in, in short course as well. So, uh, yeah, the yeah. problem is with the short course as it is, is like you say, even the strongest of the strong bikers, you're not going to drop a peloton that big that's trying to chase you down. You're not going to get that buffer to really give yourself a comfortable uh, margin on the run. I mean, let's assume you're going to Paris for the sake of this conversation. You've, you've, you've smashed it out of the park and you've been selected, which I think would be the sensible thing for your federation to do. You're in Paris. How, how much of a buffer do you need over a runner like an Alex E or a Hayden Wild in order to say, right, I'm in with a shot here? I mean, I hope that, like, like I said, I, I've been feeling really good on the run, so I hope that I can really close the gap uh towards this summer and i hope that we can come off the bike together but i shoulder to shoulder would... mate that's what you want <laughs> ideally I, I would say um 30 to 40 seconds um i think that a good martin van riel with 30 or 40 seconds can definitely do it and i would even say maybe 10 seconds but the the fact is that they have to work on the bike because um i know that i am i can produce probably a very similar run if it would be just a, a 200 watt bike or if it would be like a knife between the teeth super hard bike i can probably produce a very similar run um i think especially alex for instance struggles more with that and a lot of the other athletes again hayden i think is is uh, more of a of a gritty athlete so he'll probably also still be able to produce a really fast run but um I mean, that, that is the problem a bit with the Paris scores, though, that, like, it seems maybe, like, easy for people to hide. Um, so, yeah, I think that 30, 40 seconds, I think, and if they have to work, then I think that that could be enough um, that the medals would come from, from a front pack. But then I still have to beat the front pack guys as well. So you've just got to make them suffer on the bike, mate. You've got to make them suffer like they've never suffered before. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the plan. Huh? That's the plan. But um, unfortunately, the plan. they've they produced a course that uh, 
that is, well, it's a very good venue. It irritated me a lot last year when all the athletes were saying how good the course was. Though the course is actually, I think the course in Paris is really a stupid course. The venue is really nice with like all the landmarks, but um, yeah, they probably produced the most sleep inducing bike course possible. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's a course that's been designed with the designed with the audience in mind, isn't it? Mm. From a from a from a location perspective, not from a um, uh, a purist of the sport perspective. You know, you, they, they want panning shots of all the, the icons of the city as opposed to trying to produce the best racing possible. Where do you see the flaws in that course? <laughs> I think mainly that there's there's just nothing challenging. Like there is no um, elevation, pretty much. Um, there is no difficult corners because and and the roads are like five six meters wide, which just all makes that a group of 30, 40 people that are not even really working together is just going to roll up to like fifty k's an hour and keep rolling fifty k's an hour, and it's gonna be really hard to get away with uh with a really small group um yeah like i think that that smaller roads a bit more undulating uh probably fabricates a bit more exciting bike dynamics where uh where there might be a front group but also where like strong riders from the back get rewarded and don't just pull up everyone in their wheel um yeah, but yeah. it certainly would create a dynamic wouldn't it where those with the individual skill set of a very strong bike would have the opportunity to make a difference, <clears throat> you know, and and create gaps and make people suffer. And then you could come down to that run where those people at the front, the strong bikers, have, have spent themselves off. Can they keep, can they maintain that gap? You create more excitement, I think. Yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. But what, what I think that World Triathlon should do in this, and it's because it's not only at the Olympics right now, is that they should... Uh, just get someone like in mountain bike, like kind of a course builder. It's not that complicated in, in triathlon, obviously, but ju just get someone who, who looks at this and like who tries to make courses. And I know that it's maybe not easy to, uh, to get places to want to organize a world triathlon series. And we should be thankful that they want to organize. Um, but I think that someone that yeah keeps that in mind, like how to make sure that the bike, like, is even relevant in 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 short course triathlon. Uh, I think that would be very important because everyone that I talk to kind of just turns their TV off uh, or turned their TV off when they were watching uh, the Tokyo Olympics. So uh, that's yeah, not very good. What do you think about the state of short course at the moment in terms of an entertaining broadcast entity? Do you think that there's the capacity there to really capture the imagination of those watching and become a really high profile um, sport that loads of people watch and enjoy and consume? Yeah, I mean, actually, I, <clears throat> I do think so. I, I think that uh, Olympic distance, it's, um, it's too long if it's drafting, if it's draft legal Olympic distance, it's too long. Um, but especially like sprint distance and uh, team relays and uh, and some of the other formats like more more super league style formats, uh, I think they are actually very uh, suited for TV. Um, but yeah, I, I think that they're, they're definitely not promoting it in the right way. I mean, you guys have discussed it a, a couple of times about like also the the pay per view that they have now. Um, that's just a complicated issue um like would it be worth it for them to go to like just a free broadcast and try to find sponsors i personally think so but i like don't have it in hand and i don't know but i do think they have the really good product uh for tv though uh to to really speak to people that don't follow triathlon i think that also always in the long distance it's more difficult to be honest. Um, I, T100 is trying now and I'm part of it. And I really hope that we can succeed there as well, because I think they have all the, the right ideas about like broadcasting and everything. Like I know Miami was not uh, the best start maybe, but um, 
like they they've got the, the good ideas broadcast wise and like they they've got those connections with uh, Warner Bros um but i'm also sure that short distance actually does have like the product um but it yeah. seems like they they can't get it out so <laughs> no i mean i uh, look we we see i think what we see from super league shows that really exciting short distance racing can be created and can be broadcast in a in a way that excites people i think what we don't see from world triathlon is is them really using the tools that they've got to really mm -hmm. create that that package that makes people sit up and pay and pay attention it's like they are making triathlon broadcasts simply for the connoisseur of triathlon you know yeah. as opposed to trying to capture an outside audience mm -hmm. yeah i think that also it's the same with like all their rankings and whatever like i think they should just need someone to give it like a big maybe someone that is not involved in triathlon just give it like a big makeover and like, <laughs> tell me about it. point out like what is relevant you know like maybe we keep some of the rankings but maybe just talk about like one ranking you know yeah make like, it user friendly like, make it consumable make it so that someone who doesn't have a clue what they're talking about can look at it and go oh i understand yeah. that because now one athlete is like number 10 on this ranking 15 on this ranking and 34 on this ranking and you're like wh like what's going on you know like no one knows what's going on um and i think that would make it yeah a lot more more easy also if you want to produce like the season narrative as well uh where like yeah i think they're trying too hard with all these rankings and they're just making it so complicated um with it so transitioning across you've already mentioned the t100 the the 70.3 distance is is where we see you shine Tim Ford has already picked you to be 70.3 world champion this year. How do you feel about the T100 as a distance before we get into the actual organization and, and the series itself? I mean, obviously for me, it's a, it's a really good distance because I'm until the Olympics, I'm um, focusing mainly on Olympics. Like I already dropped it before I'll do a T100 before Olympics already. Um, but um yeah, it's it's kind of close, closely attached to Olympic distance. Um, probably more so than to real uh, Ironman distance. So for me, that's obviously good because um, it means that I need to less specific training for that event, and I can probably like switch over a lot easier. Uh, whereas if I would go and do an Ironman or a challenge like a full challenge race, like I would probably need some months to uh to transition to it um so right now for me uh, yeah i think it's it's uh the ideal format uh i want to try full distance as well as at some point but uh i obviously i don't know yet if i will be good at that so watching uh watching the race in miami you know we saw we saw some high quality racing from some very good athletes. Magnus Ditlev obviously coming out with the win. Sam Long chasing his way up back through the pack. Alistair Brownlee doing what Alistair Brownlee does. He's off the front and then he explodes and falls back to fifth. Luckily with no injury this time, it seems. Just mm. just uh, just bonking on the run and falling back to, to fifth place. Where would an on-form you have been in that field? Do you think you on your day you could have been racing at the pointy end of that one? um uh, yeah I, I i think i think yes um like obviously it were very specific circumstances there so like it was a it looked very um hard race it looked like a very hard race but Hot yeah, as fuck I, as I well, think, right? yeah yeah like crazy i think that um um yeah i think that i could be there on the bike with with the guys in the front so then it would come down on the run and um yeah obviously watching the times the times were slow on the run but it, that's obviously because of the heat and the humidity i did one race last year as well in brazil and i also expected to to run a 110 and i think i run 115 just because of the heat and the humidity but yeah like i i believe that uh that i can beat anyone in uh, middle distance and yeah like i want to prove it and i want to prove it soon so uh I have a lot of big opportunities this year and, and that's exciting. Um, 
I respect all the guys a lot, but I I I won't respect them during the race. I will try to uh, <laughs> to beat them. <laughs> Absolute smash fest, mate. Love to hear it. So, you know, the Team One Hundred as a series. You've already mentioned that you um you hope it succeeds. You've got a lot of time for what they're trying to do. What do you think about the mechanics of what they're trying to do so far? You know, Miami. You've already mentioned it. Probably wasn't the greatest start. Where do you see the improvements coming, and how do you see those improvements coming? Um, well, I, I don't really know, uh, but I, I think what, hearing from uh, from some podcasts and from uh, what some people were saying that the broadcast wasn't in their own hands or something in Miami. It was uh, like kind of a package that they had to use the NASCAR broadcast, um, which maybe it doesn't really show their capabilities uh, yet. Uh, towards um, yeah, what the next product is gonna be, uh, but yeah, I think to make it more interesting, yeah, for sure they needed m- like more cameras or even just the the cameras to move a couple of times because it was pretty much the Matisse Marguerite and Alistair Brownlee show on the bike, like just two hours straight of of them in in the image, so um, telling more of like the stories from behind, and I think also. Um, a bit more data uh, would be interesting. Like we actually sign off a waiver where we sign uh, that they can use our uh, power, heart rates, uh, whatever else. So they like have everyone's rights to to broadcast uh, all our data. Um, and I think those things can be very interesting. I mean, if you if you're watching the tour and and stuff, like now they do it also sometimes where. Or you can see like Pogacar's watts, and I'm, I'm not gonna produce that much watts, but uh, <laughs> it's very impressive, you know. Like like people will be like, "Wow, um, yeah." For instance, when you're running, and if if it would just say like uh, these, these guys are this heart rate, and I have yeah, really man. low heart rate, I'm I'm a bit like Lionel in that. So people would be like, "Holy, like he's running 320 pace, and he's at like 140 heart rate." And yeah, yeah, like or, even or even someone, the non trial it can relate. If you've got the pace differences up and then someone's running really, really fast, but you see their heart rate is so high, you're like, you're the comment- it gives commentators something to talk about, doesn't it? Because you're like, right, yeah, he's going quickly, but his heart is off the scale, so he ain't going to last long. This is a dig. Mm-hmm. This is a dig to nowhere. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And and you can even do something with, like, on the run then, with, like, the projected pace or something like that, you know? Like, like say, oh, if everyone keeps, after 5K, if everyone keeps running this pace... It looks like this is going to be the, 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 the standing at the end. And I think with that data, obviously don't make it too complicated because then also casual fans that are maybe not diehard triathlon fans would be like, well, what, what is this? Like, what is uh, all these numbers? But um, yeah, I think a little bit of that is needed to make it interesting because in the end, we're still just looking at like, some time trialist riding an hour 40 and, and running an hour uh, and there's not that much movement the whole time so you've uh, you've gone to Paris you've got your medal where does your focus switch to then I mean are we going to see you flip over and focus on the T100 series is that focus going to be the 70.3 worlds where where's your emphasis for the rest of this year no, actually, will we uh, and will we ever see you race short course again? <laughs> I, I think that uh, I might have to disappoint Team Ford, but um, <laughs> like my focus is definitely on T100 after the Olympics, and um, I have my spot for uh, for Taupo for 70.3 Worlds, but I'm not 100% sure that uh, that I will still make it there because it's gonna be like a very rough uh, period. I, I mean. I'm going to have to do at least four half distance races still well T100 races uh, after the Olympics like I'll have to see what I have still in the tank because obviously it's going to be a very hard build up towards Paris and then um doing those four T100 yeah like at, I remember from my past Olympic years that at one point the body just says uh no so yes. I don't want to put too much expectations on myself yet so um like the plan is to go to Taupo but I'm not like 
if I have to scratch it, if I'm too dead after doing like uh, the two Middle Eastern um, T100s, I might just scratch it. But yeah, the, the T100s is the main goal and um, no more short course this year and no more short course in 2025. But like, yeah, I, I wouldn't say no. Like I, I would like to uh, give it my, my try maybe in Super League or something, being like the, the Cameron Wharf in two or three years. <laughs> nice, and nice. Just see, see where I am. Like I like to, I do this sport to challenge myself and I feel like I could even on more long distance training, I could still be competitive with, with short course athletes. Like I'd like to try it as well. I'd like to give it my best uh, Wharf impression. Nice. So if, um, as the year progresses, if things start to get overloaded, it's the 70.3 worlds that will be cut and not any of the T100 races. No, I mean, I, I also signed a contract with T100 and it's basically, um, well, together with Olympics, it's my main goal for the year um, yeah. to be to end good in the ranking. So yeah, I, I don't have the luxury to scratch races as well because I'm only going to do five races. Uh, so I can only have one bad result. Um, so no, I like, yeah, I think that for me now in this, in this, this year, it's, it's more important to do all the T100s and I'll have maybe in the next years, I'll have the opportunity to combine it easier with 70.3 worlds with like, I, I have it in the back of my mind. I, I hope that I have the energy uh, to do it, but I like, I am thinking to myself to not put too much pressure on on myself yeah uh to do it now already so like in previous years gone by before the t100 existed someone in your position who you know this will be your if you when you get to paris we'll use the word when when you get to paris you race paris that's your third olympics you're you've got you've seen success at the middle distance already and we're probably going to see further success at that distance the question would always be when are you going to go long? When are you going to go long? When are you going to go long? And when are you going to do an Ironman? Now, with the with the T100 existing as it does, do you think we're going to see less of that question to athletes like yourself? Because there's an opportunity to just to race that T100 and find success there. Do you still feel the pull of racing a full distance? Or is it is it less important than it was? Mm, I, I honestly still feel it because uh, what I said in the beginning that like the the reason why I got into the sport is because of Hawaii, um, because of winning an Ironman, you know. So it's definitely still a goal in my career as well. But um, yeah, like I'll also look if 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 a T100 this year succeeds in their goal and they they'll uh, they'll be around next year for sure as well. So like. Yeah, that's an ideal circuit and, and a crazy opportunity for me, uh, like both financially, but also just the fact that I'm racing multiple times a year, the best in the world. That's what I do triathlon for. And yeah, man, like like you said, I, I won for 70.3s and actually I did take some some decent scalps there, but um, like it's usually two, three world level guys and, and even some of them the, like the one in, that i did in brazil last year like no disrespect to the competition but like there was no one in the top 30 i think from from the pto ranking uh so like that's not really what i do triathlon for you know like i can no. probably pick my races and win 10 70.3s next year uh but I want to raise the best, you know, and 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 I, that's what actually really excites me about uh, T100 that we get the opportunity to to raise the best multiple times a year, where where that was in long distance. Only the fact, uh, yeah, some years ago, um, in in Hawaii and maybe 70.3 worlds, and I, I'm actually that's one of the things that I'm a bit, but I hope that we, T100 can keep going, but it's one of the things that I'm a bit concerned about for T100. If those guys that finish 10th, 15th in all the PTO and all the T100 races, if they will have that same motivation, you know, because if you are finishing always 10th, 15th in a, in a T100 race, those guys maybe 
rather go and do their races to Dutch competition and take their wins in smaller races. But like, you, you know, if you frame it well, if you market it well, like people thought last year in Brazil that, uh, that it seemed like I became the world champion eh, for the Brazilian people. So like, you know, if you frame it good, like you can make every win seem like you just won the world chance in triathlon. Um, yeah, it's all about traction, isn't it? The T100 is, is it's a juggling act at the moment, you know, trying to trying to retain that talent without trying mm -hmm. to feel like they're trying to bully their way onto the circuit. I can I can imagine the 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 situation they're in and they've probably got a roadmap where in four or five years, they'll be looking to say, right, we've got a, a captive bunch of athletes now that aren't going to be racing outside this series. That's that's mm -hmm. presumably the where they're heading. Um, it sounds like the enjoyment's still there, mate. It doesn't sound like you've lost any of your enthusiasm or vigor for the sport. No, definitely not. And I think that's that's also the exciting thing about um, about the long course and the T100 now and, and Ironman uh, later on, like, it's kind of just opening a, a whole new sport almost like I'll have different opponents. I mean, some of the guys that I'm racing now will, will likely uh, join me next year as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's just so exciting that there's so many different races, different. And, and I think we're really well more in long distance than short distance. I think we're in like almost the, the, the golden times, eh? like, even Ironman T100 is kind of forcing Ironman to also step up its game. And I think that's something that we can't forget because I, I like a lot of the athletes, especially in the beginning of the year, were complaining a little bit about T100 uh, and not being part of it. But you can't forget that they also pushed Ironman into having the pro series, uh, having more prize money. Um, and for sure, yeah, like this is just elevating the whole game uh, in long distance. So, I think it's just super exciting times in uh, for the athletes. There we go. Well, I think the last point I want to end the, the point I want to end on is, you know, you've had a fourth place and a sixth place at the Olympics. That form is building. If your national federation is listening, give you the slot. Give you the slot. Give you the opportunity to focus on Paris without having to fly around the world chasing uh, chasing qualification criteria. That's 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 I think is the sensible decision. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I kind of agree. Uh, I know that I have to show some kind of form, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Like, I'm I'm gonna have some talks with the federation, and I hope that if I do a good race in Yokohama, I don't have to go to Cagliari, and I um, I can just yeah concentrate on on this summer. Cool. All right, mate. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on. It's always a joy to have you on and have a chat because, uh, like I said before, your enthusiasm for the sport is tangible and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Thanks for calling me. Cheers, mate. Take care. See you. Bye-bye, Jim. Mate, thank you. I thank I you for doing the world. That, Always, mate. I, I know. It's yeah. nice. It's nice to know that I can leave it in your safe and capable hands and you'll deliver the goods as always. Yeah, I think um, always a good bloke to talk to. And I'm very sure that we came up with some interesting topics, covered them all proficiently and signed off in a, in a way that will leave people with a lasting glow for the rest of their days. It's, it's, it's no news to people who have listened for a long time that I do not listen to triathlon podcasts except for Joe's. But uh, even when you do, like, I never listen to your Taylor Nib interview. I still haven't listened to I am going to listen to this one just because it's, as I sort of said, I'm sort of gushing over. It. I'm a huge MBR fan. Uh, no, I'm, I'm keen to listen. And again, I do appreciate you you doing it. You're also, you're picking, I, I'm not here next week. I'm away for a Phoenix event. So you're going to be doing, is Andy Horsfall Turner is going to join you on the podcast? Be the... Yeah, Andrew Horsfall Turner is going to come and join me as the co host. And we're going to talk about all things that are happening that week and in the future. Um, he is currently prepping for his first race of the year, which is Ironman Texas on the 27th Texas? of April. He is indeed, 27th oh. of April, which happens to be my birthday. It's going to be a good few weeks, right? Because we've got Texas. Oh, sorry. Happy birthday for then. Uh, there's Oceanside. So, so you'll be able to preview Oceanside, which is a race we sort of touched on. But I'd, I always am fascinated to get a pro's insights into how that race is going to go. Yeah, uh, you're going to send me your picks for that race as well, aren't you? 
Okay. Oh, who, so who, we can include you on the Taylor Nib for the win. Tamara Jewett in second. And I can't remember uh off the top of my head who's in third, but they'll do. I'll I've done, and then I'm gonna have for the win, Yella Gaines is gonna win it. And Lionel and Sam second and third. Or maybe yeah. Sam second. Yeah, that'll do. That's that's I'm fine with that. Fair enough. But I think Yelly Fair wins enough. by country mall. To be, I think Yelly's like, fuck, cool. So, all right. Yeah. So we'll have a good old chat about that, and uh, so next week's show will be worth a listen. Yeah. Again, it's uh, I appreciate I get a week a week off to go and kill myself for a week, which will be fun. Um, look, thank you guys for listening, James. If people want to find out more about talking triathlon, all that good stuff, what do they need to do? Yeah, if you want to follow Tim, he's at T414 on Instagram. If you want to follow me, I'm at bail.james85 on, Inst- bail. on Instagram. Follow us on any social network. Have a look for us. I think we're at Talking Triathlon on Twitter. Nope, no, at, at Talk Triathlon on Twitter. Yep. At Talking Triathlon on Instagram. You can join the Patreon group, which gets you access to all of the social channels, the Facebook group, the WhatsApp group, gets you the bonus episode. And uh, the WhatsApp group is a good crack, man. It's, it's a great... It's a great, friendly, welcoming place. You know, I haven't, there aren't many online forums that I enjoy. But I, our WhatsApp group is is good fun. It is good. There's a few pros in there as well, which is cool. Actually, yeah, uh, I spoke about and Hong Kong. Pro, and pro pro coaches as well. Yeah. Uh, one of our patrons actually raced Hong Kong, Emil Holm, who I think was 10th, I think off the top of my head. But Emil, who's one of our patrons, was racing Hong Kong. So well done, Emil. Uh, yeah. The other thing I did enjoy putting up this week on the Instagram, so if you haven't, go to uh, the Talking Triathlon Instagram, was I took that photo of Christian running on the treadmill doing his test, and I photoshopped in the the screenshot of us. I, I, I've decided I'm going to, uh, as an artiste, I want to do like a series of, of like weird places triathletes listen to Talking Triathlon, and I'm going to just find a bunch of images. Did you like my repost of it with the addition of the Mission Impossible music? I did, very much. I know you, 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 you were tickled pink by that. He said, it. and I, I think it's funny that even the even the screenshot that I chose completely like I literally just opened it up in a screenshot, but it looks like we're looking at Christian on the treadmill, so like we're actually talking at him. But I was thinking like I want to get like you know somebody looking at their watch and I put us on the screen or somebody. Like, I, I'm going to do a whole. Anytime anybody yeah. puts a photo up and they want to get out. one of those o- Oculus Rifts on the inside of one of those. Yeah, so that's going to be a little. Uh, yeah, head that head to Instagram to check out that that series. Uh, but Jimbo, a pleasure as always. Uh, thank you for doing the interview and thank you for next week. And uh, you'll be back next week. I will be back in two weeks. See you later, guys. <laughs>